So the first story this morning is of Sandoz Australia and New Zealand. Sandoz is a global leader in biosimilar and generic pharmaceuticals. And this morning we've got Guy Strong, the head of Australia and New Zealand, and Clarette Crane, who is the head of people and culture in Asia cluster, and also Roberto Romero, who is the head of people and culture organisation in um, Australia and New Zealand. So Guy and Clarette will take us through the transformation that Sandoz experienced in the last few years. So over to you, Guy. Thanks very much, uh, Corinne, and um, very uh, pleased and, and very proud and very excited to be uh, presenting here today to, to everybody. Um, big shout out to, to all my team and, and thanks for joining in uh, and uh, listening to, to the journey as well. Um, so perhaps I might uh, begin to start off by just giving you a brief introduction to Sandos. Um, as Corinne said, uh, we're a global leader in generic medicines and we're part of the Novartis Group, which is a Swiss-based pharmaceutical group that touches millions of patients every year. Um, we feel very proud of the position that we have here in Australia and New Zealand, delivering affordable medicines uh, to patients across both uh, retail pharmacy and hospital pharmacy. Um, I can pretty much say with almost absolute certainty that probably at some time in your life, if you're an Australian or a New Zealander, you've had uh, Sandos medicine at one particular time. Uh, now I'll probably go on and talk a little bit about um, our cultural journey, which really for me started in 2018 when I arrived here uh, in Australia to take on my, my dream job of being general manager uh, for Australia and New Zealand. Um, we had some performance issues. We'd had many years of, of really flat growth uh, and decline, declining profitability. So I, I very much put on my, my cognitive hat and delved in to, to see really what was driving this, this poor performance. When I looked at the market, uh, we have universal health coverage in both countries. Um, both countries' governments are committed to sustainable uh, health care, um, so market fundamentals were good. We also had a great position of strength of being third in the market. We had excellent products and a great uh, pipeline of new products coming through, and I was struck by how our employees, our, our associates, were incredibly knowledgeable, capable, and great access to, to customers. Um, so it was a bit perplexing as to why the performance was so bad. But there were a couple of things that showed that that culture was, was at the root of this poor performance. We had this term of performance culture where people were obsessive about the numbers, justifying the numbers, justifying you weren't making the numbers, spending so much time looking at the numbers, they weren't really discussing and trying to identify what our customers and our patients needed. We also had key processes that were set up to be adversarial. We have a particular meeting where we review our deals that we go to market with, the pricing, the products that we're going to sell together. It's a critical uh, uh, function within our organization. And the first one I went into had marketing on one side of the table, Salesforce on the other side of the table, finance at the head, marketing was saying that Salesforce didn't know how to sell. Salesforce was saying that marketing wasn't giving them what they needed. And finance was saying that they were trying to destroy the business, both of them. Um, it was all about winning, shouting your idea, um, no building on ideas, or really putting the, the patient at the heart of our conversations. And there was a huge lack in uh, credibility on our, our leadership. Our associates just didn't trust us. And one of the reasons was we had all these 28 priorities, um, things were confused and muddled, uh, leadership team wouldn't give up on their pet projects. Uh, and that's why we were able to give very little clear directions. And our employees were just burnt out and tired. They were 
putting out fires all the time, working really long hours, but not getting that return and reward for it. And they were, they were leaving. Um, so we had a number of things to, 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 to change. We then went and did our OCI results and um, it was quite confronting because they certainly really, really confirmed that culture. And this is one of the reasons why I love the circumplex and the OCI because it gives us a framework of vocabulary in which to understand and talk about culture. And as you can see from this, lots of aggressive tendencies, perfectionistic, competitive, oppositional, all in the upper bands. And that we're pushing other people into avoidance and, and conventionality. There was a lot of fear. We were an organization that um, really, to the fullest, the most public extent, punished failure uh, and never celebrated success. And as you can see, our, our constructive styles were, were really poor. So we needed to make a change. And um, as luck would have it, we had three great things going for us. We had a new CEO of the Novartis who was absolutely, completely committed to cultural change and bringing in an unbossed leadership style to Novartis and Sandos. Um, I had a local head of HR who was absolutely passionate about and obsessively reading about culture and had a really detailed plan of what we could do. And this wasn't a communications plan, it was actual tangible things that people would do and skills that they were going to develop. And our associates really wanted that change. Everybody knows what it's like to be in a high performing team and they want that feeling back. Um, it just feels good and it feels like the place where you want to work and do your best. So using those three, we really needed to move to our global culture that we decide, uh, describe in Sanders and Novartis as inspired, curious, and unbossed. We need to inspire people, engage them in our wonderful purpose to improve people's lives. We need to be curious. We need to learn to constantly challenge assumptions and ask um, what can be. And we need to have an unbossed culture where leaders provide clarity and the guardrails and empowerment tools for our uh, associates, but also make sure that we hold one another accountable. And underpinning all of that is self-awareness. Without self-awareness, you can't be present and manage uh, the culture change that you want to be. So first thing we did was we got really clear on our missions and mission, purpose and priorities. We, as I said, I feel honored to work in, in an industry that does so much good for people. We put that vision of improving the lives of all Australians and New Zealanders, and our purpose was to look at it with a growth mindset and provide clarity and our power people. We took those 28 priorities and put them down into the eight key things that we needed to deliver. I'll now hand over to uh, Clarette, who was then uh, the head of um, HR in Australia and New Zealand to take you through the details of the things that we did to really uh, drive that culture change. Thanks, Guy. Good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, we needed to understand what was the baseline, what was the current and ideal state. Using the OCI data that Guy spoke earlier about, uh, we purposely slowed down our usual pace and allowed ourselves time to understand the culture. Um, and we really included everybody. Everybody has a handprint in the culture. The great thing about OCI is that it gave us a language and a starting point. When you have this performance obsessed culture, the thinking can be narrow or fixed, and there's little room for error or learning. And this is why growth mindset was so important. We developed our people, we gave them the tools to have better and more coach-like conversations and we also recognised uh, that in a growth mindset culture, it's all about learning. Therefore, we really needed to build the capability of one another to give feedback and more often. So the programs that we developed had three common themes. This is for everyone, growth mindset and vulnerability based trust. The culture change was not easy because it also meant personal change. And with the programs that we developed, uh, it, it, it takes courage to open yourself up 
in these types of settings. It starts off with the feeling of being uncomfortable. And when you realize that everybody's genuinely trying, that's when vulnerability-based trust started to build. As a leadership team, we took time to develop ourselves and also understand our impact. We were no longer being asked to just deliver on performance, but to do this in a more constructive way with our people. Getting real and understanding our impact was sometimes painful, um, especially during the self-awareness process. Most leaders took this as an opportunity to develop themselves, um, while others found it a bit more difficult. And during this time, we also had to make some difficult decisions uh, with our leaders along the way. Middle of last year, we noticed as a team that we were at a turning point in our culture. So we hosted an event called the Sandoz Summit. This is a TED style forum where we invited leaders to share their leadership and self-awareness stories. This was quite a powerful way of showing our vulnerability and commitment. When people show their courage, share their stories and commitment, this is what I would call walking the talk. As a team, we had ridden so many waves and last year's uh, Human Synergistics Conference really resonated with us. We were no longer trying to keep our head above the water and surviving. We were falling off our boards less. We started to arrive a wave of being really determined and having some momentum behind us. I'm not sure what it feels like to surf, but I imagine once you've mastered the foundation and you build that tempo, it starts to become a more graceful, graceful ride. If we go on to the next slide, um, what I wanted to share here is uh, photos of our people um, really enjoying themselves and bringing culture into everyday business. Um, this, these were taken from a planning offsite. Today, we include culture in everything we do, and I'm really proud of the growth and fun our team have. This has been about unleashing the power of our people and believing that there's no organizational change without individual change. Inspired, curious and unbossed, self-aware is really at the heart of what we do. I think the OCI tool and the understanding of what is constructive behaviour really helped us get there and a lot faster. Um, today we're a team that's inspired by our purpose. I really think that we're learning and growing um, and we trust each other. If we move on to the next slide, um, this photo was taken at one of our first Sandoz summits. We now hold this uh, biannually. We constructed a makeshift mountain and each person shared what they'd like to do in support of the desired culture. What impressed me the most about our people was their understanding and commitment. The Sandals Australia and New Zealand team are truly reaching new heights. Our OCI retest was scheduled this year in April at the height of the pandemic. And I'm glad that the team decided to do the retest despite the context. This was a true test of our culture. I'll hand over to Guy to share the results. Thanks, Corette. Um, so here we go. Um, a huge transformation. I, I'm so proud of of what every single associate did to make this happen because it required everybody to give the full commitment to working in a constructive culture and to work on the things that they needed to change in their behaviors. As you'll see, we flipped it around from being a very aggressive and avoidant defensive culture to one now which is almost predominantly constructive. Uh, uh, Aggressive and defensive styles are very much in the lower end and our constructive are all in the upper banding. And I'm so glad to see that humanistic encouraging is so high and that we now have an organization where every one of our associates can be the very best that they can be and we work and build on one another. And I think it's what's driving the real performance in, um, in the numbers. So after years of being this performance-based culture, we're now growing faster than we've ever grown in Australia and New Zealand, expecting to grow 14% this year and making an incredible difference to our operating income, driving that at 30.9% this year. So a real turnaround in culture, in styles, and then in the corollary that comes out of that, the actual performance. So, so very, very proud of what all my associates have been able to do in the journey that they've been on. I did have some personal reflection though when I got this uh, result. And unfortunately I went right down into my security needs and was like, God, we've got to make this 
stick and what happens if we lose this culture. But that's why I love the OCI and the, and the words that we have around it. I could check myself and say, no, that's not constructive. That's not the culture that I want to have the organization. First of what we've got to do is actually just celebrate this and enjoy our success and share it with one another uh, and take stock and take time to reflect on the great things we've done. And then give it in a curious uh, mindset to see what we can do to learn from this and continue the momentum to make this place a place where all our consociates can be the best that they can be. I'm now going to hand over to Roberto, who's taken on the baton from Tourette uh, and is driving the cultural agenda along with all the associates. And I'll give you a bit of a, uh, Roberto will give you a bit of a framework for what we're doing to make sure that we continue on this momentum. Thank you, Guy, and good morning, everyone. So what we are doing next on, after receiving this good uh, progress and good results, uh, as, as Guy commented, we want to continue progressing and we want to continue nurturing a culture where people can thrive. So uh, we want to share with you four focus uh, area that we are working on, uh, this to, to continue building this uh, constructive culture. So first of all, to continue embedding what worked well uh, during that journey uh, in all the different uh, layers in, in the organization. So we will continue, how we're gonna do that, we, uh, we will continue investing in our people, in our leaders, and we will have a, a program that we call Everyday Leaders Program. So um, we want, I think, and we are sure that the, this important piece on investing in our people is key to, to continue in this uh, journey. So also we need to address some processes to reframe them, to make it better, to be more constructive. So we are reimagining uh, the performance management process at the moment, and we will, we will do it in a different way. Also, we will more, uh, we will include more people is, uh, inspired and be more authored of mindset. So uh, be aware and give the freedom, right, uh, to perform, to do, to share ideas, etc., etc. So increase the autonomy. Uh, we will have a, a, an, an initiative that we call choice with responsibility. So uh, give uh, people more flexibility and be able to choose where they want to work, how they want to work, et cetera, et cetera. And also we want to continue enabling people to feel safe uh, at sharing their ideas and also driving those ideas. And uh, that's why we have already in place some group of people that are working and supporting the, the, the culture at the different uh, functions, different layers, Etc. And this this group of people is amazing. So thank you, Tim. If you are there, I'm sure you are. Thank you for all that you are doing. And basically, is uh, what we will do in next. Thank you very much, uh, very much, Roberto. Um, and just to end, I thought we could uh, share some of the reflections of our employees uh, with you. presentations that the leaders did, um, Clorette, Clint, Guy, talking about their own personal journeys and being quite vulnerable up on stage. Um, seeing that from leaders, I think, is quite humbling. The, uh, the transformation of the, the people uh, in our organisation from going from a place where they have to go to work to a place where they want to contribute to see the evolution, like I got uh, here two years ago, and just seeing, just thinking of where we were two years ago on and where we are today, it's just uh, it's been such a journey, and you can see people behaving in a very different way, getting out of their shells. So it's, uh, it's that's for me the the really amazing part of it. For me, um, the introspection and the um, looking at myself and being able to um, dig deep as to where and why I do things and 
what impact that's been having on those around me. And, um, so that, that's, be, that's been a challenge for me and it's something that, uh, that I've been working quite a lot on. I would describe the culture as empowering. I think the message that I've really heard come out about our culture is that we all need to be leaders. And to me, that's a really empowering message that we're not just looking to Guy and the rest of the SLT to define what our culture is, but we as associates and individuals, how we show up at work every day also impacts that. And um, to me, that gives me a lot of confidence in where we're going as a company. For me, it's energizing. And I definitely, the more I see the people being so passionate and so committed and doing it in a, in a fun way, it makes me feel more engaged and energized and uh, the attitude I bring to work every day really makes a difference. Inclusive. And I think for me that's something that I've really noticed um, in the past 18 months particularly. Um, we're inclusive in that we think about others, we consider others, um, and we always have others at our forethought um, when we're engaging in activity. And I think it's something we're continuing to do more and more. Desire would be my word, a desire to grow, desire to change, a desire to be better than we were yesterday. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Guy. And Clarette and Roberto, um, I wish, I'm not sure if you can see the chat function, but we've just been inundated with questions and comments and backslaps, virtual black slaps and congratulations. And it is such a magnificent transformation. And um, we've got a little bit of time for a few questions. For me, what really stands out is the personal nature with which everybody took cultural change on. First of all, Guy, I'm kind of fascinated with, you know, like you arrive in 2018 to a country that is not performing well, where people are feeling demoralised and you are the new country head. What was going through your head? What was going through your mind? How would you tackle this issue? Yeah, I think it was, um, you know, the, the initial thing was uh, scared. And I was certainly very much in, in the security needs down at the bottom there. I really needed to turn it around. Um, my own personal reflection is, you know, I, I have a tendency to red uh, and that's in my own personal journey. So I really wanted to get stuck in and, you know, setting examples and pushing people. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes you've, you've got to, you've got to, to stop and look around and, and see the, uh, the things that you can leverage on. Uh, and I think that was, was great. I had always known that culture was clearly an important thing within an organization. I'd worked in high performing teams before, but I couldn't put a framework or, or the actual words around it and the behaviors around it. I knew what was good, but I didn't know how to describe it well. Mm. Uh, and I was so fortunate to have uh, Clarette as my HR business partner, to have the circumplex, and, and to just you know, take a leap of faith that, that this, was, this was going to be the thing that was going to make the change. And having that terminology, being able to just really also do my own introspection uh, and hold myself accountable uh, and ask my, uh, my leadership team to hold me accountable. I think uh, those were all the, the myriad different things that were going through, through my head at that particular time. And to realize that if you focus on what you need to do rather than the result, the result will come. So. Yeah. Awesome. I could talk to you forever, but I won't because I've got a question for Clarette. And Clarette, we're getting lots of questions around what was the leadership program? What did you actually do? I'm just going to ask you um, before it, a lot of people have trouble getting their CEOs buy-in. 
So you have a new CEO in 2018, you've been there for seven years, you've got an idea about what needs to get done. How did you go about getting Guy on board? Um, we, we can call it uh, good fortune. We, we call it serendipitous. So Guy started um, back when the organisation had just undergone um, a significant restructure and we needed to do more than just stabilise the organisation. As you mentioned, I'd been here for seven years and I'd been a year in the HI head role and I just knew we needed to do something different. Um, the vision was to create a place where people genuinely love to come to work and they can make a difference and grow. I did plenty of research. I got obsessed with culture, as Guy mentioned earlier, plenty of reading. And I also exchanged ideas with mentors that I knew who had made the shift before. Um, at the end of the day, getting Guy on board was about having a concrete plan that was more than just a communications campaign. It was about developing our people and it was about being able to connect that to the needs of the business. Um, so for those asking questions about the program, that's really what I focused on. Um, Guy trusted me, gave me the autonomy. I kept my commitment, the tempo, um, while calibrating on, along the way. So I, I learned so much um, <laughs> and, and, and really enjoyed it. Claret, if I just ask you one more question before we go to Roberto, what do you think was the mm -hmm. most significant thing, the most significant thing? If you had to put your, your finger on it, what would you say? I think the most significant thing was developing our people and trusting them. That was by far, I think, the most impactful thing that we could do. Great, thank you. Um, Roberto, if I can go to you, you are the new head of people and organisation in Australia and New Zealand, and you're actually based in Mexico, so we haven't mentioned that, but um, and on, our, on his way into Australia. But Roberto, what was it like joining the organisation at, at this point? Sort of, it had gone through, Clarette talked about being able to stand on the surfboard and um, gone through this amazing transformation. Did you experience anything different about the organisation? Yes, yes, I, I really enjoyed the conversation because I had my first conversation with Clarette and with Guy in February this year on, on this uh, journey. So the passion they have on the culture and the journey and the commitment they have in this, this journey was, was amazing and very consistent. And uh, I could say that maybe there is no only one way to, to improve the culture, but uh, I, I could uh, tell you that I identify many good aspects on, on it. Uh, I identify that the leadership team really believe that we can make the change. Uh, there was a real great strategy in place uh, handled by, by Claret and the leadership team. Also, it was embedded in the different layers. And for me, that was an important part of, of it. They were walking the talk. Everybody was really committed in creating this new environment, this new type of culture, right? Uh, so uh, we were investing a lot in, in, in people and they really feel it and they will really believe it because that is also important. And so uh, at the end, if I could summarize, it was uh, everyone's journey. It was not from a leadership journey or people and organization or HR journey. It was uh, the journey for everybody. And yeah, we are now uh, in, in the middle of continue embedding this, this culture, but also progressing into a uh, continue more uh, constructive culture, what we call inspire, curious and a boss culture in, in Sandus. Great, thank you. We have two, a minute left and um, I'm just gonna ask one question, squeeze it in. So is there anything, I guess Guy and Clarette, that you um, would do, would have done differently? It, it, it's a difficult one. And I think the, the key thing is, um, we had a couple of leaders that weren't on the journey with us and, and didn't come on that journey. and. Um, you know, you give people the benefit of the doubt, uh, you invest in them, you coach. Uh, but in the end, I sort of think maybe we could have come to that conclusion, that person, or those people and myself and realized this wasn't for them and it wasn't for me um, because the implications of of one or two individuals, especially in leadership teams who are not role modeling the values and behaviors, 
destroys trust and destroys everything else that you're doing. So that's the one thing. I, I don't know if putting back in it, even with hindsight, whether I'd have made the, the, the change that quickly, but it's the one thing that I, I think it would be better if we had come to that conclusion, the two of us. Thank you.